Club, thank you. Um, in our final presentation in this session, we're going to change um, focus a bit. Uh, we've been talking about what happens when food enters the gastrointestinal tract and how those signals get to the brain, but now we're going to look at sort of factors that influence what it is that ever gets to your mouth in the first place. And for that, we have uh, Dr. Laurette Duvet, um, uh, who will discuss contextual influences on food intake. And Dr. Duvet holds the James McGill Chair of Consumer and Lifestyle Psychology and Marketing at the Desautel Faculty of Management of McGill University. Dr. Duvet is the founding chair and scientific director of the McGill Center for Convergence of Health and Economics. Her research investigates the cognition, affect, and behavioral economic processes underlying consumption and lifestyle behavior, and brings to bear complexity sciences to examine how such knowledge can inspire more effective communication successful health-sensitive innovation and ecosystem transformation for convergence between health and economics. Dr. Dre. Um, you need to tell me what I do to forward. Okay. Thanks, Daniel, and thanks to uh, the traffic controller at the airport in Washington not to have canceled my flight from Toronto at 6 a.m. this morning as he did yesterday from Montreal at 7 p.m. I'm very pleased <coughs> to be here uh, with you. Um, I was asked by the program organizer uh, to be like a bridge presentation between this morning, the three presentations were essentially about homeostatic processes or things that happen, uh, hypothalamus and below. This afternoon, uh, we will be uh, moving up and uh, looking at higher, quote unquote, higher level brain function that impact human decision, uh, uh, decision making and behavior. Uh, I was also asked, as Danielle was saying, that to link the very basic research that is done uh, in neuroscience and in physiology, whether it is higher or under the hypothalamus, with real-world behavior, and real-world behavior uh, within the context of an environment that we know has evolved uh, over the last 300 years uh, to be very different than the one that our uh, ancestor had known throughout the evolution. And my colleague neuroscientists always say that the brain has evolved to feed oneself. Uh, it is very important to bring the neuroscience knowledge to bring solution to the problem of behavior that we have in the real world. So this is within that context that um, uh, I will uh, focus to, to deliver on what I was asked first, uh, which is uh, talking about the, this context, uh, but um, in, in order to address uh, those issues, we need to talk about four levels of context. Uh, and I will be reporting essentially, I'm a behavioral scientist, so I will talk of construct that we have been talking earlier, uh, hunger, satiety, uh, food intake, and so on, but from the perspective of uh, behavioral. So I will uh, first report studies where we see the interaction between uh, the uh, higher level brain systems, that is the primary context within which the homeostatic uh, and digestive systems are operating. Uh, then I will uh, present some further work on the context of fetal programming uh, that is very key uh, in, for a life course of, uh, of influence of both uh, the uh, neural programming as well as behavior. <clears throat> then I will uh, move to the family context, the home context, which is the earliest one that the human biology encounter when a, a child comes to birth. And there is interesting behavioral work there also that can influence uh, your uh, thinking. 
And then I will be talking about the broader social context of the food environment. And in each of them, <coughs> I, will be, I will not get into the detail of the mechanism nor into the detail of the methodology. It is very much to give you an overview of this, uh, of this, this science that is there. And that is very, uh, not only complementary, uh, but necessary to weave with the basic neuroscience or with basic biology. And this is uh, within that context that, uh, pending upon a time availability, I may talk to you about uh, what we call this brain to society model of eating the, uh, behavior that over almost 10 years now, I've been spearheading a network uh, within McGill and worldwide about scientists in the basic science, uh, scientists in, I'm in a business school, scientists in economics, political science, and so on, and also scientists in the medical science with the idea that until we go beyond those silo and find a science that brings this together, um, we uh, will not reach the full scale that we need to reach in addressing those uh, problems. Uh, so this is essentially uh, the agenda. And this, uh, depending on the time, uh, we have work on the, on the conceptual framework, but we also have an IH funding to start working and developing some computational model of those complex processes. So first aspect, uh, the, uh, the context within which uh, the, uh, the uh, digestive system is operating uh, at, uh, in interaction with uh, the higher level uh, brain system in decision making. And this is from a diagram from a paper by my colleague Daguerre. Uh, who has been uh, doing an excellent review of fMRI study of appetitive and digestive system. I won't get uh, through all that because I think this afternoon uh, Dana and other will do it more than me, uh, better than me. But here, uh, I won't walk you through this diagram, but this is a recent uh, neuroscience and neuro, uh, neurobehavioral review we published uh, where we look both at the neurocognitive tasks and the personality study on what are the neurobehavioral correlates of eating behavior and BMI. And essentially, uh, it is whether it's personality or neurocognitive, you get two core um, higher level brain system, you get the striatal motivation, and you get the lateral prefrontal executive control and so on. So this is within that context that uh, the first experiment that I want to talk about uh, is um, a study where uh, we brought subjects to the lab. Uh, you most likely know, the, may or may not know the Dutch eating questionnaire, uh, which is essentially an assessment of the mental schema uh, that individual impose uh, over homeostatic signal in defining eating. Uh, so you get restrained, you get emotional, and you get external. Uh, and those who are high in external eating have a well-known predisposition to forget homeostatic signal to react primarily to the hedonic cues that are out there. So you get individual difference. Uh, difference. And uh, you also uh, get um, episode level variation in this. So in this experiment there, uh, we had people to come to the lab and each um, uh, doing uh, a task, the, it was a puzzle that they were doing, and six times we were interrupting them to eat chocolate. And in one case, we were instructing them to really remain focused on the experience of chocolate and so on, and the other one was saying, keep working on the puzzle. And what I will be reporting here uh, is the, the uh, impact <coughs> on uh, the, um, the, what the consumption has done uh, in the change in self-reported hunger pre and post consumption. Uh, the eye external eater there, uh, what we found consistent with the literature is that uh, they experience hedonic response much more intensely and their decrease is in hunger is much lower. The low external eater that normally pay attention to the homeostatic signal 
look what happens uh, when we get them sensory, uh, focus on their sensation. There's basically no decline there. Uh, whereas if you leave, <laughs> let biology alone in some way and uh, do not focus on the sensory experience, you do a very important uh, decline between the pre and post consumption. Uh, the uh, second part here, uh, the second study that I want to talk about, uh, this one has been published in Physiology and Behavior already a good number of years ago, and still very much uh, this Dutch eating questionnaire that I was talking, uh, we did, uh, it was a sample of adult um, uh, uh, men and uh, adult women, I believe, um, and we did extreme group analysis where we take we took the subjects who were high schematic on all three, where basically uh, those were uh, more uh, letting their emotion driving, letting their cognitive control, and letting external cue. <coughs> and we look at those who were higher uh, on the tree uh, schema, uh, a low, a higher than the median, and the other group, uh, the high schematic was those who were high, uh, high schematic individual. And here the task of the subjects uh, were self-reported comfort food consumption. And they were telling us what is it that they have been eating and we were coding, uh, coding the, um, uh, their uh, change. <coughs> we were coding whether it was high calorie or not. And they were also reporting uh, how hungry they were when they started the, uh, the consumption uh, and at, at the end of the episode, and how full they were, the measure of satiety, as we may do in a behavioral context, uh, how full they were when they started their episode of comfort food, comfort food consumption, and how full they were at the end. And here I would like to attract your attention to the last uh, three lines there. Uh, there was no, when we look at the uh, change in the pre and post consumption uh, between the low and high schema to see whether the higher level mental are interfering or not, what you do see that in this experiment, uh, this is not hunger that has the effects, it's on satiety. If you look at comfort food, we eat comfort food very often outside of regular meals and so on. And what you do see is that uh, for the low schematic, for those that rely much less on those mental schema, uh, you see two or three things. You see that the <coughs> They, uh, they are pre-consumption fullness, like uh, they are, uh, when they start a consumption episode, they are, they are uh, less full than the one uh, that, uh, of the, than the eye schematic. You also see that the fact that they eat change the fullness uh, more than the other. So the point that I want to, and in addition in this paper, we also see that the, the low schematic are indeed <coughs> having a much a healthier pattern of comfort, uh, uh, comfort food consumption. So the point that I want to make here in, the, uh, in the, the bridges is that when we will be moving this afternoon in looking at higher level reward learning and things like that, uh, there is, I think as we move forward, uh, we need to study uh, in much closer interaction uh, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the reward learning, the executive control, but also in relation with the homeostatic, uh, homeostatic processes. Uh, this last one in this series is one <coughs> by uh, uh, someone from the University of Chicago. Uh, and this one, uh, still making the point of the higher level processes, uh, is uh, an important uh, an interesting one here uh, in this is that she got subjects to come to the lab and have them eat chocolate. And they are told uh, that, and the same piece of chocolate, <coughs> they are told that uh, this thing is framed as a healthy uh, product, a healthy bar or something, or as a, test, a tasty product will be a snack and so on. This absolutely the same objective food that the subjects put in their mouth. They are framed in one of those two frames. And in addition, she has another condition. In one, she is saying, uh, you, <coughs> uh, 
uh, your job is to taste our health bar or candy bar, whereas the other one, would you like to try our health bar or candy bar? So here, I'm bringing this as kind of instance of free will interacting with the actual response there. And what you do see is that uh, when subjects have their uh, free choice, uh, you get essentially what you would expect. The sample that is uh, LT uh, is, um, is uh, and the experience on GER is after the consumption. That's what I need to specify. So the subjects that are, uh, that are uh, having the tasty, uh, the difference is not significant and it's very similar. Whereas when you look at what happened in the conditions where subjects are a forced choice, uh, what you do see is that uh, the consumption of the same foo uh, food frame as healthy compared to tasty, uh, consumer report feeling hungrier after having, uh, having being forced to eat a, taste, uh, a healthy food. And that is kind of the, the point that I want to bring to your discussion here is that uh, this is behavior is a science, and if you, if, if the, uh, the decision, uh, the, the neuroscience and physiology is to translate eventually in this, there has to be some merge of those uh, those research. Uh, I'm now uh, going very briefly <coughs> on the uh, fetal uh, environment. Uh, uh, here, uh, what uh, uh, what you do, uh, uh, I'm sure you are familiar, and I think some of the panelists here have been doing work on that. Um, the fetal environment is, uh, we, we really think of it as a key context influencing biology and behavior. But uh, if you, I'm sure all of you, if you look at the right uh, lower part of this diagram, uh, most of you are familiar with the famous Barker hypothesis, the thrifty gene, uh, that low birth weight <laughs> is associated uh, with uh, increased risk of metabolic symptoms, uh, various change, uh, uh, reprogramming in metabolic pathways, and increased risk of diabetes uh, and uh, obesity later in life. And what I want, this, this diagram <laughs> was produced by a collaborator uh, of us uh, from Brazil, uh, Silveira, and, um, and Portela in, uh, as part of a, a review upcoming in the Annals of the New York Academy. Um, and uh, the two points, I won't walk you through, uh, the, um, uh, through the, the whole diagram. I would like to attract your attention uh, to the up uh, higher, uh, the, uh, the study there about adult life, where they, they look at <coughs> the uh, women who were 24 years old, from a birth cohort that, has been, that had been observed uh, over the lifetime. And what they did find there is that even 24 years, uh, at 24 years, that low birth weight women were, more, uh, were uh, con uh, consuming more carbohydrate and having higher BMI. So this notion of environment on the life course, and at the other extreme where you get, that's also uh, <coughs> the same group, uh, they took a preterm uh, newborn's baby, 27 weeks, and look at low birth weight vs control for the same gestational age, and expose them to taste sensitivity test. And the effect is there also. The low birth weight, uh, they react less uh, to the taste sensitivity because of the increased need. Uh, so, so at both extremes, so the, the point that I wanted to make here uh, is that uh, uh, fetal uh, environment is not just about physiology and not just about disease. It's also about food and behavior. And relatedly, uh, maybe just one, <coughs> one, uh, uh, one brief uh, uh, report here. Uh, we have just collected, uh, it, this is a self-reported uh, birth weight by mother and child, but we have just uh, collected uh, 616, 6 to 12 years old, uh, children, and uh, in the um, in the low birth weight here uh, in this uh, in this cohort, um, we essentially uh, find the same thing that you that was reported before. So I'm not showing this result. What I'm showing here is that we did not look just at the low birth weight. We also look at the other extreme of the distribution, the large baby, and what you do see there. 
whether, uh, whereas <coughs> with the low birth weight, there were, and those are the same, the DEBQ, so those are kind of those uh, mental, the behavioral schema that we talk about. Uh, in the low birth weight, the effects was on eating per se. They were consuming more fat, and there was a trend to um, a significant effect on uh, BMI, but it did not reach it. Here, there was no effects on consumption, no effects on BMI. It is on emotional eating and restrained eating that the low birth weight, <coughs> the large birth weight, uh, were having uh, more behavioral risk factor there by more restraint and more emotional eating. And we know that those have been associated with. Uh, uh, with, uh, are associated with obesity and BMI. Uh, <coughs> and as we look, we do work both in industrialized and developing country. And when you look at this, the, the challenge of the double burden of undernutrition and obesity, I really believe that uh, starting to look at birth weight, what happened there in the whole distribution, and how it impacts uh, over the life course, uh, as I said, not just the, uh, the metabolism and the programming. Okay, <coughs> here I want to show you all of those uh, uh, for the interest of time. <coughs> That's the same cohort here, um, 616 Canadian children, uh, 6 to 12 years old. Um, and we had, um, in terms of parental influence, uh, attachment uh, is one of the constructs that, that has been extensively studied um, from, in both animals and humans about the role of the primary caregiver in defining how a, a person or an animal uh, decide to explore beyond what has, been prog uh, what has been programmed at birth. And we talk about secure attachment when you get a context where you can, uh, you can do better than you can do something that is not necessarily what you are programmed for uh, and insecure attachment. So here <coughs> we uh, report uh, the uh, insecure attachment kid in this sample, uh, they have uh, three, three points that I want to make. Uh, we, had, we, uh, we measured a 24-hour rec uh, recall, and we also looked at uh, not only food we need to look at, uh, it's also the other behavior in our life, the other habits that influence what we do in some way. So here we were also measuring this, and uh, uh, the uh, unsecure attachment High eating schematicity on all three dot schema positively predicted uh, the, uh, the uh, consumption of uh, more caloric and negatively predicted less caloric uh, food. And <coughs> you also have uh, skip breakfast, eating out, and eating in front of the TV. So you do get uh, the, uh, uh, this, uh, and the influence at home, um, and I may, uh, this second one here, which is with, the, uh, with a subsample of this, where we look in this one, there is another scale called uh, the, uh, the food rules that the parents use to guide the interaction of their kids with food. And there are three of them. The one that I'm bringing here, that's the, that's the one that was where there was most interesting effects, uh, is the one where the parents use the food, and typically it's high caloric food, to reinforce a good behavior, whether this good behavior is cool or whether it is, uh, and withdraw the food to, uh, to punish against the, uh, so here, uh, so that was one factor. <coughs> and we also look, uh, you may know the BAS scale, the behavioral activation system, uh, which is a measure of, um, of uh, reward sensitivity. And it has been well validated with neurocognitive uh, uh, responses. And here what you do see is that the effects of food rules and BAS on children, what you do see is uh, those parents, and it, uh, just for the boys, and the boys who, have, who are having a high responsiveness to the environment, for them what you do see is that those that the parents have been using the rule of uh, food as an instrumental reinforcement for other behavior, those were having not only higher uh, total calorie intake, but also higher fat and uh, sugar. So I will skip this one uh, in the interest of time. 
uh, to talk briefly <coughs> about uh, the, the broader environment. And here, uh, I won't uh, read you to this, but here we are talking about what you hear in the media all the time, the food environment. Uh, the uh, increase of industrialized food, the increase of fat, sugar, salt, the increase of advertisement, and so on. And there are uh, a, a good number of correlational evidence that over the last 30 years, there has been increase in the intensity of all of the above, and uh, it has translated in uh, behavioral um, and, um, uh, and BMI change. But if we want to bring solution, uh, the idea is really <coughs> that we need to study this scientifically as much as we study the body scientifically. And uh, this is within that context that our group has really uh, led the, the, the development of using uh, the data that are available in this food environment to see can we <coughs> Uh, can we have a, a diagnostic of the nutritional quality of the food environment in a given unit of observation? Here, what you have there, uh, it, you may know the Nielsen data, which is essentially reflecting what is in the store and what is in the advertisement. And those data are available weekly at a level of, of uh, geographic resolution uh, that is very good. And what you have there <coughs> is the uh, island of Montreal, uh, where my uh, colleague Bakri Janal have been uh, working in geo-referencing uh, those, uh, the, uh, this, we take the category soft drink here as, uh, as, uh, as an example, but that's also one that has been uh, the most uh, reported and the most studied. And <coughs> what you do see is that um, it is the case that, and the various uh, density reflects the density of soft drink sale, uh, and then you get the uh, relationship of the, uh, with the uh, socioeconomic uh, status. And yes, you do see that, <coughs> that uh, geographically uh, there is an overlap. Uh, I think that uh, it's almost um, uh, an, an, a decrease of 10K of, uh, in income is associated with a twofold, I believe, increase uh, in, in uh, soft drink sales. So there is, uh, I'm presenting this uh, to move further uh, the type of research that we need to do there. If you look also, the same, <coughs> the same geography, uh, you also, uh, look, this one is about diabetes prevalence, um, and you also see that uh, we need to, uh, the same way when we study the cell and we are so controlled and so, the same has to happen at the level of society. So here, where we are moving is taking area and look at what are the layers of context that are operating there. And let's see how can we scientifically not only study them cross-sectionally, but start looking at causality from a spatial temporal perspective. And this work go one step further in the sense that <coughs> so far I've been talking about area, census track, or uh, here um, an area or an aggregate is great, but the one who does the, the, the behavior is always the individual. So here we define a buffer zone around the, <coughs> around the uh, where an individual uh, lives and we characterize this environment in terms of its density. In that context, what I will be reporting, it's in terms of the density of fast food. That's a study that was published in AGCN uh, in 2010, uh, adult in Montreal. And that same scale, that is a psychological, <coughs> um, a psychological proxy for, uh, for uh, reward sensitivity, when we were looking at the relationship between the density of fast food in a given geography around uh, the person household, uh, and uh, we were looking uh, how is it related to uh, the, uh, the consumption being reported by the person, overall there was no, uh, the, the relationship was not significant. When you start looking though, uh, in terms of the reward sensitivity of the individual, what you do see uh, is that, 
is that uh, the low BAS, those who are not responsive, uh, um, who don't have this biological or neurocognitive predisposition to react to the environment, those ones, whether there was fast food or not around them, did not impact them at all. Uh, you get uh, the top tertile for those there was, after having con controlled for a lot of things, including income and so on, uh, the more uh, the increase in self-reported consumption was linearly in that context and uh, proportional to the density of fast food. So the point that I would like to make uh, is that uh, there is a need, this, and maybe I will, uh, I will skip, uh, uh, there is a need to bring the science of the, the context being included in all the level interacting. And uh, I will be stopped in, uh, in, uh, in two minutes, so I will just um, uh, give you uh, a, a few, uh, just a conceptual part of the brain to society. Uh, my colleague Alain Daguerre is the one uh, who uh, educated me to this, eating as a neuro behavior. If we believe that eating is a neuro behavior, a motivated choice, it means that uh, the, uh, whether it is the metabolic, the rational, or the motivational brain system, we, behavior is determined by this in immediate interaction with the context, with the environment. So that is why, <coughs> and what uh, makes the challenge um, uh, even bigger is that that environment operates on different time scale, different geography, different jurisdiction. So what we, uh, in, in uh, I will, well, just briefly, uh, in developing, I was telling you that for 10 years we have been working at this, and between 2005, 2009, we have been hosting with the international uh, chairman of uh, the obesity task force, those think tanks. And because addressing obesity, as I used to say to Phil James, is transforming society. And um, it, it, the medical uh, research is critical, but it's not sufficient. So we had those four years of think tank and it attracted, Danny Kahneman was with us, Paul Krugman, we got all the world leaders that were very interested, but if it remained just think tanks, um, the, so we used it to kind of uh, articulate, uh, I will skip this, <coughs> articulate this framework, uh, which we call the brain to society model of eating behavior, which is, um, let's take a solution oriented. We want intervention that are more effective. We want public policy. We want uh, uh, qualified scientists and professionals that, uh, that address the problem that we have. Uh, it means that we need in some way to get real about bridging the, the, tame, the term self to society, brain to society, uh, is, uh, is floating for more than many, many years. <clears throat> but to what extent can we operationally articulate this uh, into something? And last, uh, in 2012 is really when uh, we got this whole thing more mainstream by a special feature in the uh, proceeding of the National Academy of Science, where <coughs> Uh, each level has to be studied with the same depth that we study each level, but it has to be looked at from a system science framework. And that is from that perspective that, uh, and I will uh, skip to the end, uh, that is from that perspective that we are currently uh, developing, just to be fair with my colleagues, uh, well, uh, we are developing various a series of computational models that we conceive in a modular manner, very much like the brain, to see to what extent can we combine the theory, the empirical data, and this computational approach to <coughs> look at those. Uh, and in uh, 2010, uh, we have published this uh, um, handbook at Elsevier that, that does, <coughs> does cover uh, uh, the essence of what we are talking about. Um, I want, as uh, everybody has been doing, uh, thanking the collaborator from the McGill University. As you see, you have that diversity. Uh, collaborator from other university and our trainee. And <coughs> the funding, um, uh, I did not have time to talk more uh, much about the think tanks and the active insights projects, um, but uh, we have peer-reviewed research 
uh, by medical, social science in Canada, USA, uh, India. Um, those think tanks were supported by uh, the philanthropy and uh, research. And this Active Insights project, which is essentially about, we are, we are developing this very uh, schematic computational level uh, model of this complexity, uh, strictly based on mathematical formula, reward learning, and so on, uh, to introduce progressively individual variability, contextual variability, and these projects here uh, that, is, uh, uh, that uh, is currently going on is to say, uh, let's take individuals that navigate well the modern world, those who have problems, uh, and let's see what are the diversity of motives that drive their behavior and then progressively integrate this. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks.